Well, without further ado, we'll go over and um, I'll start the question. And you all have it here. I'm going to start with uh, Judy Halstead. And we're going to ask uh, all three panelists, with Judy starting, what are the criteria and principles that all health professions have for core competencies? So how can including core competency concepts and accreditation standards be linked to improve quality in education and healthcare systems? So as I began to think about that question, and I do have brief little notes here to stay within my two minutes, so hopefully I won't hear the gong, I really focused on the, the how. How can core competency concepts be linked to improve quality? Well, that takes me back to what has to happen in order for accreditation to be in position, or accreditation standards to actually be in a position to include core competency concepts. So I think, first of all, I thought there has to be the collaboration. And we spent the last day and a half actually talking about this. Collaboration across the disciplines has to occur to identify what those core competencies would be. And in order to have that piece occurs, that means you have, the, have to have the linkage between education and practice because you can't identify what those core competencies should be without the two entities coming together synergistically to identify those. And then taking some of the feedback that we heard yesterday from Susan and then what Malcolm actually also uh, re-emphasized this morning, if we really want to improve quality, we, we actually have to know what we're talking about. So what do we mean by improved quality? Uh, how do we identify that? What are some evaluation strategies to measure that? So you kind of have to know where you're going. And so as I look at all of this, the value lies in the process of getting to where those core competencies can be identified and then included in our accreditation standards. So I think that is why I will start the, the responses and I will stop there before my two minutes. Thank you. Rick? You know, I'm starting to understand what Kafka meant when he said life's not as simple as it seems. Uh, in terms of trying to put together what is the appropriate flow and relationship between quality. And so I went actually to the Department of Labor's definition to say, okay, how does the Department of Labor define competency in the first place? And I'll read that to you, is, is a cluster of related knowledge, skills, and abilities that affect a major part of one's job, their role or responsibility that correlates with performance on that job that can be measured with well-accepted standards and that can be improved by a training and development, which is basically what we've said for the entire course of, of the forum. The question becomes one in the detail. You know, the, the, the goal is obviously pretty well agreed upon by all of us, but how do we then improve the quality of education in terms by including those core competencies? I will say that many of you, uh, or some of you I'm sure are very much aware that indeed the Department of Labor has already taken this on with their pyramid of, of competencies, which goes through seven and, and it's a pyramid because the, at the base would be what anybody who's interested in healthcare should have as a, as a base competency. And that includes even down to pretty much the general education requirements that you would have in any university. It then tears up, and at the top of that is really where I think our forum is going and, and ultimately what we have to define because that's the specialized accrediting uh, competencies that are need to be defined and, and to be taken, <coughs> analyzed by each professional uh, association. But it is a pretty good um, place to start in terms of all of those stepping stones. It's, it's kind of like St. Peter's you're going to, on this rock, you'll build a foundation. And on St. Peter, I will quit. <laughs> Somebody started with St. Peter, and you're going to quit with St. Peter. Okay, thank you, Rick. Now we'll go to Peter. Okay, um, <clears throat> a couple thoughts. Uh, there are some things going on right now that relate heavily to this. Uh, the IPEC competencies have been out there a number of years. They've been uh, incorporated across uh, our, our group, the Health Professions Accreditors Collaborative. We've all said we can live with these. They work in our, in our standards. Um, and a lot of this has to come from the stakeholders about their expectations. 
And I think uh, the case study I would give would be um, the Canadian system and specifically the University of Toronto. You have a um, value-based payment or a fee-for-service, I mean, as opposed to the current fee-for-service model that's evolving here to value-based, they get the fact that doing this better is important to them from a financial standpoint as well as a patient outcome standpoint. They, uh, the dean at the University of Toronto and the CEO of the hospital said, we will make this happen. We will include all these things and get you know, these standards to agree. And then we will prepare team-based people who can do better and give us better patient outcomes in the end. Uh, so again, I also want to say that this is more than pre-service education we're talking about. It has to be continuing education. Uh, the, the example we just talked about, if there's, if there's a virus threatening all of us, we're not going to go to the schools and train the students to wait till they graduate to come out. That has to be a continuing education uh, enterprise. Okay. Thank you, uh, Rick, and the rest of the panel. Now we're going to toss it out to the audience, the participants. Comments, questions? Eric? Um, I think the uh, IPAC comments is a really good place to start. Um, there's work going on. There, there may be some low-hanging fruit. But I have another question for the, the panel. Um, what we haven't talked about the last couple of days but has been implicit, uh, what competencies do accreditors need? And so that was really triggered by the conversation this morning about how CARF does its work and, the, and you know, very nicely described by Christine about the competencies needed by the site visitors to do that. We really haven't talked much about that. And yet, the, with the changing dynamic, is that something we should explore more? I love people's thoughts. Great question. Any response? Uh, we're an independent group, so I had all kinds of management business type needs that I had to have. But more importantly, because we were reviewed by the Department of Education and the Council on Higher Education Accreditation, um, we had to understand their requirements and how we meet them. Um, and then, um, more importantly, to make sure that our uh, processes were in place, that, that they were fair, that they were not arbitrary, uh, and that we made good decisions. Uh, uh, our board is consistent of practitioners, educators, regulators, and a public member. So we get a lot of perspectives. Um, and that uh, I think the other issue is that, you're, that we're willing to learn and that the association that we involve ourselves with uh, allows us to keep up, know what's going on, take good ideas, and implement them. I would just add to that uh, the notion of not remaining static and remaining dynamic as, a, as an organization and making sure that anybody who's representing the work of the accreditation um, uh, body re has that as part of their core values, remaining dynamic and open to, to change. And I also think having a clear understanding of what it means to be looking at a process and also what it means to be looking at an outcome. You. Uh, it was interesting. I mentioned yesterday. I went back. The first uh, accrediting body in the United States was accounted for colleges around 1880, uh, which is a, obviously a long time ago. But but philosophically, at that time, and from every change that's occurred since then in the accrediting bodies up to the recent CHIA establishment of CHIA, accreditation has been pretty much by every accrediting body uh, focused and, and used as their, their mission to protect public health and safety and to encourage and improve the pu for public interest. So I think one thing we need to, to learn or follow as accreditors is, number one, to always go back to that benchmark. You know, what is the impact of what we're doing? How is it going to improve public health? public safety, and also the public interest. If we use that, then that's consistent, I think, with what our, our lessons have been for, for the day, and that that will be a, a great guiding, guiding light. I do think one other observation I've made, having been at this a good little while, I, I love the transition from, and hope we maintain, from policeman to facilitator and encourager and improver rather than 
uh, as somebody mentioned the other day, here they come, you know. Uh, and we've moved away, I think, in most of our accrediting bodies from that to one of quality improvement of the outcomes.